All right. Uh, hey, everyone. You're here because you want to learn a little bit about full stack uh, development, particularly with Node.js and NoSQL. So has everyone used Node.js in some fashion here? All right, a few of you, all right, perfect. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I'm Nick Raboy. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Couchbase, and this is my colleague, Arun Gupta. Um, I do a lot of development in uh, various web technologies, Java, Node.js, and then a lot of the mobile technologies as well. Um, I'll let Arun give a quick background on who he is. Yeah, uh, my name is Arun Gupta. I work at Couchbase. I run the developer advocacy team here. Um, my background is heavily into Java, enterprise Java, so uh, all sorts of web application development. And for our past 10 plus years, I've been building developer communities at Sun, Oracle, Red Hat. And uh, I'm loving my time at, Red, at Couchbase now. So what does it mean to do uh, full stack development? So previously, I mean, not too long ago, you'd, you'd have back end developers, you'd have front end developers. Uh, you'd have people who manage the database. You'd have people who manage infrastructure, so the operating system, the server, stuff like that. But now you have full stack development, and the full stack developer's role is to really manage all of those solutions. So uh, they do a little bit of everything. Uh, so if you look at the, the common stacks from previously, so um, on the left, we have a, a Linux operating system stack that runs Apache server. Uh, it uses MySQL as a relational database, and then it uses uh, PHP. Is, it, is everyone familiar with this stack? They don't know what it's called? I'm sure most people have probably touched it at some point in their development career. Uh, but things are, things are a little different uh, now, because in this old stack, uh, you, uh, managing Linux and Apache, it was a little complicated to do. Uh, having to manage the MySQL database, having to worry about doing upgrades, having to do about all kinds of permission roles and stuff like that. Uh, managing PHP from both the, the back end code perspective as well as the front end, uh, it's a little messy. Uh, so things have changed now. Uh, a lot of people are moving to Node.js, so you're, you're working with a Node.js stack, so commonly you're working with Node.js as your back end. You're using Angular as, as a front end outlet. Uh, you're working with now frameworks, so it's not just raw JavaScript that you're using, you're using frameworks like Express. Uh, and then, more importantly, people are switching over to NoSQL for these, for these modern technologies because nobody, when you're developing an application, nobody um, works with raw uh, rows and results of a database. It's, it doesn't work that way. Uh, so typically what happens is, well, here's an example. So um, on the right, we have a document database, so it's JSON format. And on the left, we have a common setup for a relational tables. So let's say um, we want to we want to do a conversion here. So there's, there's many ways to store data inside of a NoSQL database that's document format. Uh, so let's say, for example, when we're querying the, the tables on the left, we're, we're always going to query them together. We're never going to try to query user skills and only user skills. So we're going we're to do a join. We're going to do some kind of uh, complicated query here. Uh, so if, you, if they're always being queried together, uh, wouldn't it make sense to store all of that data in the same place and, and only do one request, something a lot less complicated? Uh, so that's, that's one way to store your data. You can store everything in the same JSON document. Uh, you, say, for example, you didn't like that approach. You could always still uh, model your data uh, as if it was kind of like a uh, relational database. You could do what's called the referred approach, and you could create a, a new document for each one of these tables and then refer to each of the other documents the same way you would a relational database. So you have, you have options when it comes to storing your NoSQL data. So where is, where is NoSQL a good fit? Uh, I like to think of it as a good fit for modern applications. So you're, you're working with modern web applications, modern mobile applications, IoT. Uh, and this is because uh, a few things. So often nowadays when you're working with APIs, you're, you're getting JSON data back. Uh, so if you're storing this data as JSON um, and you're receiving JSON, it makes it a lot easier to work with. So the, that's one perspective on why it works well with modern applications. Another perspective is you're, you're developing applications that are designed to be able to change at, at any given notice. So uh, say, for example, uh, your data needs to change tomorrow. That's something that would be particularly difficult in a relational database. Being able, you'd have to run upgrade script, you'd have to do all kinds of this voodoo in your code. Uh, to make this possible. So uh, that's one perspective. So it also, you also have the ability to scale better uh, for, for higher demand with, with NoSQL. Uh, but it's not a replacement to, to relational databases. There's still a need for both. Um, so maybe you have legacy applications. Maybe you have applications that require full ACID support. 
Uh, maybe you have transaction-heavy applications. There's still a need for both. Um, you really just have to pick and choose what's, what's best for your application. What, what kind of application are you making and what best fits? Yes? Yeah, so you're, you're talking about um, normalizing your data, right? Yeah, so in NoSQL, you don't need to normalize your data. It's perfectly acceptable to have multiple copies of that data. It's just a different mindset of development. Potentially, yeah, because it really comes down to how you've chosen to model that data. It's, it's, if, you're, if you're choosing to have multiple copies of that data, you need to, be able, you need to manage it from your application layer. through the, So you'd have to keep track of it that way. Yeah. Um, so since, uh, since uh, we do work for Couchbase, um, we are going to be using that throughout the examples uh, of this Node.js project that we're going to build. Uh, but I do want to let Arun give a, an overview on uh, what Couchbase is before we do a deep dive into it. Yeah, so <clears throat> if you look at the different NoSQL databases, there are typically four types of NoSQL databases. There is a key value you know, where things like Redis would fit in well, um, Memcached would fit in well. Then the second one is the document database, which is what Couchbase is going to be. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, then there's a columnar database, which is like Cassandra and uh, graph databases like that fit in well. And then the fourth one is really a graph database, which is like Neo4j and other tools fit in. Now, what we are talking about today is a document database. And a Couchbase is a distributed NoSQL document database. And one of the unique capabilities of Couchbase is it can also, it can not only be used for persistence, it can actually be used for a key value pair as well. So it purely depends upon how you are storing the data and accessing the data. So it can be used as a managed cache or a key value store or a document database. By document database, I mean is you take the entire JSON document you persist it into the disk, and you can read it back from it. So that's sort of the key part of it. Now, that's sort of the Couchbase on the server side of it. Come to the mobile side of it, you know, Couchbase also has this uh, mobile, Couchbase Mobile, which essentially consists of three components. There is a Couchbase Lite, which is an embedded database that can sit on your mobile phone, whether it's iOS, whether it's Android. You pick a device, Xamarin, whatever it is, it can sit over there. And it has those capabilities by which it works with your uh, native um, framework to you know, be able to access the data. And this is very useful, particularly in the cases where you don't have full connectivity to the internet all the time. So you, know, you can store some local data or metadata about your apps, for example, in the local device. And the beauty of this is where the sync gateway component, which basically connects your mobile database with the database running in the cloud. So it automatically, you know, when the connectivity comes up, the database sitting on the device uses the sync gateway to connect to the database in the server, and it is automatically synchronized. So not just like you know, a database in the cloud or database in the mobile, but we, call, we like to call it as a full stack NoSQL database because it runs from your device to the data center. One of the key aspects of Couchbase really is, really we would like you to build with agility. You know? These days, when we look at an application, your applications are constantly changing. You know, it gives you something called as a flexible data modeling. So today, let's say you have a profile where you have username, email, address. Tomorrow, you want to add a Twitter profile there. Then you want to add a Facebook profile there. Then you want to add a LinkedIn profile over there. And these are growing demands. You know, then tomorrow, there is a rabbit profile or a cow profile. And you kind of keep adding those different social media networks. In a classical database, in a relational database, you will have to go through your database migrations, schema migrations, data migrations, all of that. Here, it's a flexible data model. You store the JSON data in the uh, JSON document in the database, and you access it using your application. So it really doesn't matter. You know, there is no relational constraints or integrity constraints that you need to be worried about. There is no schema. Your app really defines what the schema is going to look like and what each document really means like. Developers are familiar with SQL, so that's what we, we love. Uh, so Couchbase has some really powerful querying capabilities, which I'll talk about in a little bit later. Um, 
it also has integration with lots of different big data technologies, which I'll talk about in a second as well. And we talked already about you know, the mobile and IoT concepts, where you, know, you can actually have Couchbase sitting in your edge devices. It's a very low battery footprint, a memory footprint, that can actually sit on your edge devices and then communicate with your gateway as and when the connectivity is up. So that's, I think, a very common use case that we are seeing with Couchbase these days. So those are some of the points on which you can develop with agility, but what is equally important is that you can operate at any scale. And these are some of the points that we highlight over there. So one of the cool concepts of Couchbase is where it's a single node architecture. I'll talk about that in a second, but the idea is, is unlike a master-slave architecture where you're writing to the master and reading from the slaves, because that's when you start choking. You know, that master becomes like a bottleneck over there. Uh, but here, Couchbase is a single node architecture. So you can have one node, or you can have another node. They're all homogeneous. And you can write to any node, and you can read from any node. It automatically does sharding for you, which is a unique capability of Couchbase. And that makes it really very easy to scale. It not only just scale, but it gives you that consistent performance for you. you know? And we have seen results where we are linearly scaling the node, and we can actually have that many users concurrently accessing the data. Uh, always on availability, so you can easily do rolling deployments with Couchbase. One of the unique capabilities, again, which our customers love is a cross data center application. DR, or disaster recovery, is very important. So you can easily set up Couchbase in two separate geographical uh, clusters and set up cross data center application. Yes, you can do full cross data center application. You can do even filtered cross data center application. You can only replicate this particular data. So I think there are some concepts that are relevant. And then, of course, we have uh, enterprise security. Uh, we have RBAC, you know, X509 certificates. All those features are in there. And last but not the least is the simple and the powerful administration aspect. You can administer using a very powerful couch-based web console, which is accessible from wherever you are on the web. There is a REST API integration, and there is a CLI as well. All those concepts are very relevant, and you know, which gives you really gives you not just the dev components, but the ops component as well. So you have Couchbase up and running. Now you want to get that Couchbase working with an application. Well, um, unless you are Oracle, and don't quote me on this, unless you are Oracle, your database does not define your application stack. Uh, so. If you are Couchbase, then you've got to hang out with where the cool kids are hanging out. You know, if you are building a Spring application, if you want to run a Docker container, if you're building microservices, you, know, if you, you pick a framework where you are hanging out, you tell us what you want to use, you know, if, what operating system you want to use, you know, what cloud provider you want to use, what language you use, you know, whether it's Java, whether it's Go, whether it's Node, whether it's PHP, you know, we have a language binding to it. If you're using Spring Framework, we've got a wonderful Spring data integration with it. If you are using you know, Cordova, Ionic, Unity, Xamarin, pick a mobile frame framework, we've got integration with that. Um, you know, pick the operating system of your choice. One of the things that's missing from this slide already is Couchbase 4.5 was released last week, and we uh, offer production support for running your Couchbase as Docker containers. So all of that. Literally yesterday, we also... Couchbase is the only NoSQL vendor that is primed for OpenShift. That means it's technically ready to run Couchbase on OpenShift, and that is the only supported offering on OpenShift. So lots of cool things. Now, those are the tools and the frameworks that where you sit. My point is, we just wanna, don't want to dictate tools for you. We want to just bring Couchbase to you. Similarly, with the big data, big, big data ecosystem, you know, you pick a framework that is that you care about. So, you know, uh, for example, pick Spark. You know, Spark is very good at in-memory analysis, but you want to persist that data. That's where Couchbase fits in very well. You can do in-memory processing in Spark. You can either use Couchbase memory architecture, which kind of complements very well, or you can use it to store data in the persistent database as well. Similarly, you know, we have uh, some wonderful JDBC drivers which allows us to integration with third-party uh, BI tools. So pick it Tableau, pick it uh, Informatica, Talend, all of those. You know, we have very wonderful integrations with them where you can actually generate BI reports on top of that. Similarly, you know, uh, Solar, Kafka, Confluent, all of those you know, in terms of different storage solutions as well. So it kind of fits very well in the broader big data ecosystem. Now, I kind of hinted about this a little bit earlier. Uh, Couchbase has a single node architecture. 
What that means is, here is one node. Now, essentially, if you're running a database, you need three services. You need index, you need data, and you need query. Those are the three services that you need. By single node architecture, what I mean is, you know, on a single node, you can have all of these three services together. And then you can have cache, storage, cluster manager, replication, all of those capabilities kind of baked into a single node. So once you fire up a single Couchbase server, all of these services are up for you. By homogeneous cluster, I mean is you can fire up multiple of these Couchbase nodes, and then you can say, pick any node. There is no master. Pick any node as sort of the master and add other nodes to this, and then this becomes a homogeneous cluster. There is no master or slave as such. You need to pick one node in the cluster, and you write to it, and it automatically figures out where it needs to be written. You write, read from it, and it figures out how it needs to be done. And how would you do that? So let me give you an example. So for example, you will have a Java language binding. Or you, uh, Nick will talk about Node.js binding. So you know, if you're writing applications using Node.js, you will use the natural Node.js programming model. Or if you're writing a Java application, you will use a Java API. You say couchbase.connect, you give it the host name, and it just goes on over there. Well, it goes a step above and beyond this, where it's not just, you know, um, you can configure your Couchbase server where you say, hey, index data and query are my three services, and they have three different, dem they have different demands. You know, if I'm using um, data, I need a SSD. And if I'm using indexing, I, maybe I need more CPU. If I need query, maybe I need more you know, processing power. So what you can do is you can take it to the next level where you say, I have this set of machines that have very good memory, this set of machines that have very good processing power, this set of machines that have got, got very good disk. So I'm going to run my index, data, and query services on them. Only index, only data, and only query. We call that as multi-dimensional scaling. So it truly allows you to scale your architecture meeting your needs as opposed to giving you an architecture that this is sort of our opinionated view. On the bottom right, what you see is a snapshot of our Couchbase web console. And again, this could be um, validated by X509 certificates and stuff like that. So you can easily manage it. You know, on the, on the bottom right, again, if you see, there is server nodes, data buckets. Um, you can see indexes. You can see cross data center replication. All of that can be very easily set up using the web console. And again, of course, as I said, it's fully backed up by a corresponding REST API endpoint list. Now, whether you are using CLI or you are using Web Console, they both, behind the scenes, end up using the REST API anyway. So I mean, I, I've, I've played with all three combinations. I end up using the, them. You know, again, to me, it's all about the right tool and the right job. So depending upon where I'm calling and what is my context, I will use the right tool, basically. But to you, it's very simple. Somebody you know, who wants to get started, start with Couchbase Web Console. And now you are advanced. Now you want to automate the whole damn thing use the CLI or the REST API. Now, in terms of accessing data from Couchbase, there are three ways. You know, if you want to use Couchbase primarily as a key value pair, so each document that is written into the Couchbase has a unique document ID. You know, and that is, again, as Nick was talking about, you will have your own, own data model. So as part of the data model, you've got to give it a document ID. So you can access that document as the doc, as using the document ID itself. That's sort of the key value access for it. And the, and the advantage is operations are extremely fast with very low you know, um, latency. Because you know the document ID, bam, you just give the ID, and you get the document back as is. So it's very straightforward in that sense. There is caching built into that layer already for you. So you know, all those advantages kind of come along with you. Then there is uh, scatter gather queries, where we can say, you know what, here you go. Run the query across these multiple nodes. It'll do everything for you. The fun part is where we talk about Nickel. Now, Nickel is the new language that we introduced last year. Developers are familiar with SQL language. You know, SQL is used for relational databases. So you say, select star from table foo, um, and give me like five, five counts, for example. That's sort of the language that we are familiar with. Now, one of the fundamental, I don't like the name NoSQL, actually, as a matter of fact, because it always says, I am because of what I am not. That doesn't make sense. No SQL really means not only SQL. So it's giving you a different paradigm by which you can store your data and access your data. In our, in our terms, yes, not only SQL, but we are actually giving you SQL-like language now 
to query your JSON documents. So think about, you know, in terms of Couchbase, you have a bucket. And in a bucket, you have a whole bunch of documents stored. When I say whole bunch, I really mean few millions, maybe billions. You have millions of documents stored over there. Now, on that document, you want to query. How do you query? So you use this nickel language, which is very similar to SQL. So you can say, select star from bucket, and then you say where, like, group, joins, nest, unnest. We were talking about data normalization earlier. So you nest, keep the data nested or unnest the data. All those things, all those syntaxes are available to you. Um, and I think the beauty of that is this is a language that you're familiar with. Instead of being using only a relational database, now you can apply that to a JSON document database as well. Of what? Lotus Notes. Whoa. <laughs> I won't make any comments on Lotus Notes because I've never used it. <laughs> but, well, I think the big difference really, as much as I understand Lotus Notes, this is actually storing a JSON document in the database. So to think about, and I think Nick will talk a little bit about data modeling as well, but instead of having three tables, scatter your data over three tables, you're going to put them into one JSON document, and that document goes into the database. Right, and I think the other benefits over here is you know the inbuilt memory caching, the caching that you get. You also get the SQL-like query language. You know, you also get to have all those Java language, the language bindings, for example. So a lot of other things, and I think we have come a far away from Lotus Notes in this case. Right. We all have scary memories, absolutely. All right. Yeah. So I'll take over now. Um, so now we're really going to focus on Node.js and, and a lot of code. Um, so our Node.js SDK for Couchbase uh, uses the Couchbase C library. So if you wanted to use C, it'd be similar. Um, but like Arun mentioned, there's no particular framework necessary uh, to use the SDK. So if you wanted to use Express Framework for Node.js, if you wanted to use Sales, if you wanted to use something else, that's perfectly acceptable. We're going to be using Express because that's probably the more common one uh, for Node.js development. The SDK also allows for minimal uh, coding, and I mentioned this earlier about uh, database maintenance. If you're coming from a relate, who is it? does everyone work with relational databases in here? It sounds like everyone does. So, um, what happens when you need to uh, change your data? Is it is it hassle, or it, I mean, change the structure of your your tables? You have to usually talk to your DBA or or write some kind of script, right? Um, if you write some kind of script, that's a lot of code that you have to write in order to do that, generally. So uh, with NoSQL and Couchbase in general, if you want to add a new property of data to your database uh, or any of your documents, you just add it. You don't need to go upgrade every single uh, table that's out there, every piece of data that's out there. You just, you just do it. Um, it also minimizes your code from the perspective of uh, querying your data. So I know this will be less of a a mind blow uh, to people who work with uh, relational databases, but you actually pass these nickel queries to Couchbase. Couchbase does all of the crunching, returns the data exactly um, how you requested it, uh, so you don't have to do any kind of application layer parsing of your data. But if you have ever touched another NoSQL database, maybe Cassandra, maybe MongoDB, um, a lot of the data manipulation happens in the application layer, not the database layer. Uh, so, yes. Uh, so yeah, so they're both document databases. Uh, so Couchbase, where it really thrives, is it has the memory layer built in. If you wanted to get a memory layer in MongoDB, you'd have to install Redis or some other application, and then you're managing two different applications to get the job done. And, and as you scale your application up, that, that becomes very exhausting. Um, it also, so Couchbase also has the SQL-like language, Nickel. Uh, so it's a very familiar language to a lot of people, 
makes it very easy to start development with, with Couchbase. The other problem with MongoDB is, classical problem, is their inner architecture, the, the, archi the basic architecture itself. It's a master-slave architecture. You know, you write to a master and you read from a slave. So generally, our customers come to us from two points of view. One, who want to go away from relational databases, and they want to look at the NoSQL database. They have done their due diligence. They've done their benchmarking, et cetera, and they say, what, we like Couchbase, they come to us. That's one way where they come to us. The second way customers come to us is where they got excited by the initial hype by Mongo. So, yeah, I love the whole aspect, but then they burn their fingers with Mongo, where they say, you know what, it's good to get started with single node, two nodes, and I'm loving it, but now my app is scaling, but Mongo is choking, because I'm writing to the master, and then that's, kind of, that's where my app starts choking. That's when they start looking at it, oh, you know what, NoSQL is good, but I'm not getting the performance, that's when they look at Couchbase. So Nick gave two perfect examples. You know, um, Viber, for example, was using lots of Redis plus lots of Mongo. And Viber is a communication app just like WhatsApp. Um, they got rid of all the Redis and all the Mongo, and they said, oh, we're just, just going to go with Couchbase. Because it not only gives us key value um, uh, memory, but it also gives us persistence as well. So if, if you do want to learn more about the Mongo versus Couchbase thing, I actually do run a podcast as well. It's called the NoSQL Database Podcast. I interviewed a company called Nuance, uh, where they switched from a relational database to Mongo, and then they switched from Mongo to Couchbase. Uh, so it, it gives some perspective on, on what they went through, if you're, if you're interested further on that. Uh, so what does it take to get Couchbase up and running in a Node.js application? Uh, so first of all, you would use NPM, Node Package Man Manager, to download the library, the SDK. Um, and then what you would do is you would import it. So you would do the require, you would require Couchbase, and you would open a connection to the Couchbase cluster. In this case, I'm providing one IP, which is my local uh, computer IP. Um, because they're peer-to-peer, -peer, as soon as you make that connection, your SDK will, will obtain a cluster map of all the other nodes in your cluster. Uh, if for some reason when you're booting up your Node.js application that node uh, is not available, well, it's a good idea to probably pass in an array of possible nodes to connect to, um, so that way you have options. Uh, once you've established that connection to the cluster, you can open up a Couchbase bucket. So a bucket is a collection of NoSQL documents. Generally, you would have one bucket per every one application, and you would store all of your different document types in that single bucket. So you could have people documents, you could have department documents, you could have any, any number of combinations of documents inside of this one bucket. Once you've opened up this bucket, um, if, you've ch if you're deciding that you want to use nickel in your application, you would create this uh, nickel uh, query object. Um, so we aren't using it in this particular slide, but at least we know how to include it in our application. Let's say we want to insert data uh, using just a CRUD operation. Uh, we would create a uh, JSON objects, a standard JSON object. It could be have arrays in it, it could have nested objects, it could be cr all kinds of craziness. Uh, but we would create that JSON object or that JavaScript object and we would call uh, bucket.insert. We would provide it a document key. We would provide it uh, the actual uh, JavaScript object and we would provide it a callback uh, so that way we can do something depending on the, the error or the success. Uh, the key that we provided it, it could be anything. It could be something that you can remember. It could be some kind of unique, uh, uniquely generated key. It could be some kind of key that you're incrementing on a counting basis. Um, it could be whatever you want, really. So here we have a function. This function is going to be used probably in the next six slides as well, some, some similar variation to it. Uh, so first of all, let's say um, we have this function. It's called query. We're passing it a SQL string and we're passing it a, uh, a done variable. Let's, let's say that's a, a callback function. In this case, uh, Couchbase doesn't understand strings, so what we have to do is we first have to parse it into a nickel query, um, so something that Couchbase can understand. And then we can execute the query. So we can call uh, whatever the open bucket is dot query, pass in that, that parsed query, and we'd also pass in that, uh, that callback uh, in regards to what to do uh, when it's complete. So if there was an error uh, in, in this execution, uh, in this case, we're, we're printing an error to the logs, uh, we're responding to that passed in done callback saying that there was an error, and we're breaking out of this, this function so far. Otherwise, if it was successful, uh, we can return that there was a success, whatever that result might be, uh, and exit out. 
So I do have a demo right now. This demo is going to be the basis on the next slide. It's, we're, I'm going to show you the slides on uh, the code on what it took to build this simple demo. So that way you, it brings it all into perspective. Oops. All right. Uh, it looks large enough. So um, this is probably the most simple demo you'll ever see. Uh, it's it's very common when you're learning a new uh, programming technology. This is a basic record keeping uh, demo. Uh, so you can add new items to this list. You can edit items in the list. And of course, you can remove items from the list. So I'll walk through it, and then it'll give you something to go off of. So I'll add a new item. So I've just added a rune to the list. Uh, so let's say now I want to edit a particular record here. So I, I could click the edit. Uh, let's say I want to use my short name here. Uh, but I know it's going to be very small. But actually in the URL, um, I am passing in the document ID. So with that document ID, I can then pre-populate this form. So I'm going to save it. Uh, it's now saved uh, to my list. And then finally, I'll just show you the delete to, to prove that it's working here. Uh, it's been deleted. So if I go over to the Couchbase administra administrative dashboard here, let me sign in, because Couchbase is, of course, running on my local machine. Uh, this is what you would get when you first log into Couchbase. You saw this in a picture um, that Arun showed you. Uh, you could see information about your total RAM, uh, different operations on your buckets. Uh, you can check the status on each of your individual nodes. So I only, of course, have one node. Um, but what we're looking at here is the data bucket. So I'm actually using a bucket called RESTful Sample. And if I open it, I have this one document which reflects accurate. If I click it, um, it's just JSON data uh, for what I'm storing here. Uh, another cool feature about the Couchbase administrative dashboard, uh, starting in 4.5, which just came out, is you can actually uh, run queries in it similar to how you would with, say, PHP My Admin or another another admin dashboard. So if I wanted to run uh, this simple select statement, I'd execute it. It shows up in the list as JSON. Uh, maybe this is not something that I, that's easy to read. I can click table, makes it more tabular, something that uh, relational database developers would be more familiar with. So it makes it really convenient, makes it really easy to use, uh, very powerful stuff. So let me go back to my slides here. Oops, still booting up. Yes? Red Hat? Um, I, do you have so, answer to answer that um, one? You can run Couchbase on RHEL. Um, that is a supported offering. That is a supported platform for us. You can run Couchbase as a container on OpenShift. That is a supported offering. What else are you looking at? I mean, there is a. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and I, I do have a video on YouTube on how to get it set up on, on Red Hat if you're interested. Um, it take, it's a five-minute video. Uh, but but that, that app that I showed you, uh, so as far as our stat goes on the left uh, that I showed you uh, previously, we're actually using Couchbase in it. Um, this, this stack is uh, often referred to as the Keen stack uh, by us internally. Um, I've also heard other people call it the Chain stack or, or the Cena stack, like John Cena. Uh, but but we're, we're more familiar with it as, uh, as the Keen stack. <laughs> the application was actually broken up into two parts. So we have uh, the AngularJS front end, and then we have the Node.js and Couchbase server back end. So why, why did we split it up here? Uh, well, there's, n there's no more Jade markup in this case. So anyone at some point in time who has ever touched Node.js has probably run into Jade markup. I personally find it to be the worst thing that's ever existed. Um, so by removing it, it makes my life a lot more pleasant. Uh, it makes it more API driven. Um, so you're now making requests against the back end from your front end instead of piping in data to your Jade. Uh, it allows um, your back end to be able to evolve independently from your front end or the other direction. Uh, it also allows you to expand your front end to other uh, interfaces. So maybe you want to take this AngularJS front end. Maybe you want to create a mobile version for it. As long as you can make HTTP requests, you're good to go. Maybe you want to pull it down to another kind of platform. You can create all of these other front end interfaces and still have this same back end. Uh, so an example, 
Um, I can't prove that this is what they actually do, but it's my assumption. Uh, so for example, gaming consoles, I can purchase games on my phone. I could purchase games on my, my video game console. I could purchase them on my web browser. I assume that these are all front end interfaces to a back end that maybe Microsoft or Sony has. Uh, so otherwise it'd be, I imagine, very difficult to maintain all of these. Um, so we'll look at the, the code now for the Node.js backend. Uh, so because I like to keep things clean, I actually pulled out all of my static, uh, my constants here. I pulled them out into a config.json file. So this will contain my Couchbase information. It contains my locally running uh, server. It contains the bucket that I want to use. Uh, and then what I would do uh, is I would, I would go into my Node.js app.js file. This is the driver to my Node.js application. Uh, so I, let's assume that I've already downloaded these dependencies with NPM. Uh, now I want to import them. So I want to use Express Framework. I want to use the body parser so that way I can make post requests against my, my application. I'm including Couchbase. I'm including Path so that way I can access uh, bits and pieces from the, the application. Um, I'm including the configuration file that I just created, and then I'm initializing Express. Uh, this is part two of the app.js file. It was a little long, but this is really all there is to the app.js file. Uh, so after I've included those dependencies, um, I'm now sort of continuing to initialize them. So I'm saying I want, I want to be able to accept post requests uh, that contain JSON data. I want to open a connection to Couchbase. I want to establish a connection to the cluster. I want to open a particular bucket, that both of which I defined in my config.json file, um, something that you've already seen on a previous slide. Uh, and then here I have this uh, use express uh, path.join. Uh, this is because I've chosen for this particular application to bundle my, my front end code within the Node.js application. Maybe I want to take that, that AngularJS front end code, maybe I want to store it on Amazon S3, maybe I want to store it somewhere completely different from this Node.js application that's perfectly fine and I could just remove that line of code. It's, it's perfectly fair game. Finally, I have uh, my routes include here. So routes are API endpoints. Uh, the, the Angular JS front end will, will hit a different route for every kind of thing that it wants to perform. Uh, and then I establish the server on port 3000. So this is what it would look like for one of the routes, one of the endpoints to our application, one of the entry points to getting data. Uh, so this would be uh, the endpoint for, for saving or creating. Uh, so what, what we would do is this, is this is we're listening for post requests against this create endpoint. Uh, we're saying that if the post body does not contain a first name, then we're going to return an error. This, this error is going to be returned to the AngularJS uh, front end. Um, we're also, I couldn't fit it on the slide here, but we're also going to do a check for the last name. We're also going to do a check for the email address. If all three of those conditions pass, uh, then we can call this create function uh, of this record model that we're going to create about three slides from now. Um, and this is really just going to interface with Couchbase directly. So we're, we're not doing any kind of Couchbase code inside of this endpoint. Uh, depending on how, Couchbase, how this function responds, we're either going to return an error to the front end or we're going to return some kind of success. Uh, now for the routes, uh, another route. So this one is for getting a particular document. So let's say we've entered that screen with the form and we're pre-populating that form. This is the endpoint that would be hit. Uh, so we're doing a get request. Uh, we're making sure that a document ID is provided in this request. Uh, if it was not, return an error. Otherwise, um, run the query or run this get by document ID and return the response. So you can see a trend here. All of these endpoint functions are going to look the same, including this next one, which is practically the same thing that you've seen so far. So I can keep creating more and more endpoints. They're going to be pretty much the same makes it very easy to maintain, at least in my personal opinion. Um, and it, life's good that way. Uh, now we look at the actual uh, functions that interface with Couchbase. So the create endpoint calls this uh, save function, which on the other slide I think it was called create. Uh, use your imagination here that they're the same thing. Um, but we're actually passing in that request body. Um, we don't want to trust that the, the request body is good because uh, NoSQL, just like relational databases, can suffer from injection attacks. So what we're doing is we're parsing out the data here. Uh, we're saying that we only want the first name, last name, and email. Uh, we're, we're assigning a property called type. Um, and then we come to this ternary operation here. 
Uh, so this, this is an optional parameter that I did not validate for because it's optional. Uh, so if document ID exists, we're going to use it. If it does not exist, we're going to generate a unique ID for it. Uh, and the reason for this is because we want to actually use an upsert. We want to hit two birds with one stone, and we want to do a create or a replace for this particular function. Upsert, if, if the document ID does not exist, it'll be created. If it does exist, it'll be replaced. So uh, we're actually just going to do an upsert. We're passing in the, the key. Uh, we're passing in the, the JSON data. And we're, we're executing it and returning whatever the response is back to the parent function, which is that endpoint. And then you saw this already, uh, but this is what it would look like in Couchbase server when it's saved. So now we get into some, some cool stuff here. Uh, and I'll highlight it here. But this is the get by document ID function. Uh, so in this case, I'm running a nickel query. I'm selecting the first name, last name, and email address. Um, I'm selecting it from this open bucket. I'm aliasing it as users. Yeah, users. Uh, you'll notice that we are not storing the document ID in the document itself. You can, but we're not in this case. Uh, but we are doing a comparison against the document ID as part of one of our conditions. So what we have to do is we actually have to look in the metadata about the document. So we call this meta function. Uh, we can access information like uh, the document ID, what type of document it is. Uh, there's a bunch of other properties as well. Uh, but we can compare against it. You also notice that we're using dollar sign one here because we're doing a parameterized query, again, to prevent any kind of injection attack on us. Uh, we're parsing this query into a nickel query. Uh, and then when we run uh, db.query, uh, not only are we passing in the query, but we're passing in an array. That array is each of the parameters for our query. We're executing it, and we're returning the result. If they hit the save button four times? No, they, they pass four different times, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, in this case, since we're, we're comparing against the, the document ID, there's only going to be one document ID uh, per document. There's no, there's no duplicate IDs. So in this case, uh, it'll always be the same thing. Yes. I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understand. So <clears throat> I think the question is about if I have saved the document four times, will it be saved as four different documents or the same document? You do override the document, essentially. It purely depends upon the function that you're calling, actually. You know, are you calling upsert, which is, as Nick said, create or replace? Replace itself says that you're going to replace the existing document. Yeah, so you don't have to use upsert. You can use replace. You can use insert. Uh, it depends on your application logic needs. I think one of the, one of the important parts that we need to understand Oops. is I built my applications with relational database all my life. So over there, a lot of the integrity constraints are in the database itself. You are basically pulling them out by schema less. Those constraints need to be managed by your application in that sense. And that gives you flexibility. But as they say, with great power comes great responsibility. That's more of an application thing anyway. You know, I mean, like, you know, because that history is, as a matter of, fact, matter of fact, not stored in a relational database as well. You create, right? You create exactly. So again, you create, so you create as a document document. Or... So whenever you're trying to create a database, True. Yeah, you can create a, a document with a history trail if you want. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Good. 
Uh, so a, a final function here that I'll show you, uh, this would be for uh, removing data. Um, in this case, I'm calling uh, the remove function. I could easily just do a delete query like I would in, in SQL. Um, I'm just changing it up, being different here. Um, but I'm, it's, it's all of these database interaction functions, they're all going to be similar. Just like the endpoint functions, they're all going to be similar. And long term, easy to maintain. If I came back to my code a year from now, I'd probably be able to figure out what I did. Um, it's not all mangled and, and mess, messy. Now let's look at the AngularJS side. How am I doing on time? I almost out of time. Uh, AngularJS code. Uh, so this is a little different now. So we have an app.js file. Uh, this is different from the node app.js file. In this case, uh, this is an endpoint which I didn't show you because it was very small. Uh, but let's say this is the endpoint for getting all the data and populating that list on the screen. So I make this, uh, I can make use of the AngularJS HTTP service, do this get request against that particular endpoint. If the response is a successful response, I can loop through the result set, adding each of the results to the application scope, which can then be rendered to the screen. Um, let's look at another uh, AngularJS function here. Um, this one would be for saving. Uh, it's a post request this time. Um, and then data would be our post body. So we're providing a first name, last name, email, and then this optional document ID. If that document ID doesn't exist, it'll be null. But that's all right, because our back end will we'll cover it. Uh, so I showed you some pretty, pretty simple, simple queries. It uh, doesn't really show you the true benefit of nickel yet. Um, so here's some more complex queries here. So um, again, not so complex if you're looking at a relational database, because it's probably something familiar to you. Uh, but here is a union statement where we're unioning two data sets together, something particularly difficult uh, when it comes to NoSQL, but not Couchbase. Uh, we're, we're doing a parameterized query again, um, but it shows that it's a little more complicated. Now, if I wanted to take it a step further, uh, here's another much more complex query. So this time we're, we're doing joins in this one. This one, joins are incredible to be able to be able to do it in, in Couchbase. Um, so we're selecting an ID, we're selecting name, flight information. Let's say that we're selecting travel information. It's coming from several different buckets in this case. Uh, in this case, we're actually, I mean, two buckets. Um, so this, this is bucket, uh, we're selecting, not two buckets, I mean uh, two different documents. Uh, we're selecting uh, from our, our open bucket, uh, we're aliasing that as R, let's call R routes, routing information. Uh, this routes uh, data set that we have, has an array in it. So what we want to do is we want to make it more simple to work with. So we're, we're going to flatten that array. We're going to unnest it. So this, this scheduling information array is now flat at this point. Now let's say we want to join data against it. We're joining within the same bucket because you can have multiple document types in the same bucket. Uh, and we're joining wherever the, wherever the document key, the document ID equals airline ID. And you can do joins across buckets. That's, it's all up to you and how you've decided to design your application. Uh, but in my case, everything exists in the same bucket. So by doing all this, it makes it, this, this would be a lot of code, probably 50 lines of code in, in a different database technology when this is very short. So it's just to show you the true potential of, of Couchbase. Um, I'm not done yet. I just want to show you that these, these links to the, the examples that I, that I have here, uh, I, I did provide the slides so you can download these slides, have access to these links if you want to look at the source code yourself. Uh, the TriCB Node.js is the more complicated queries, more complicated code. Uh, the RESTful AngularJS sample that I have here, it's the one that I showed you, uh, very simple. If you want to learn about querying, uh, you can actually uh, visit this uh, query tutorial. It's interactive. You can query against a, a live data set here. Um, and uh, it really shows you, it really trains you on how to, how, to, how to not only use SQL, but how to use Nickel. So I, I saw a lot of hands earlier when it came to uh, Node.js knowledge. I assume that, were you guys using Mongo by chance? Anyone using? Yeah. So Mongo has Mongoose. Uh, we actually have our own uh, ODM called Ottoman. And conveniently enough, it uses the same APIs. Uh, so if you're familiar with, with Mongoose, being able to use Ottoman is, is a breeze. If you wanted to convert your application to Couchbase, it'd be of no stress. So if you wanted to create an Ottoman data model, um, say, for example, this data model has a first name, last name, and email, uh, and accreted at. And then if you wanted to uh, make use of this model, in this case, I'm creating exactly that. Um, as you saw on the previous slide, I have accreted at. It's defaulting to the current date, so which is why I didn't have to include it here. Uh, and then I would just call save. 
I wanted to query that information, I could use uh, find, the find function. In this case, I'm, I'm doing an empty object, meaning I'm just going to find all data that was saved. Uh, if I wanted to, I could be more specific in that, in that find query. Uh, but if, if you're familiar with, with Mongoose, this, this would be uh, a breeze for you. We're going to switch gears here. We're going we're gonna to talk about a little bit of mobile. So this, uh, as full stack developers, uh, you're probably going to have to face mobile development at some point if you haven't already. Does anyone work on mobile apps at all? A few people. All right, perfect. Uh, so when it comes to mobile, we already talked about uh, Couchbase server. Um, so that, that's one component. The other two components are Couchbase Lite and Couchbase Sync Gateway. And let me remind you, all of this is open source, so you can actually go, go online and, and download it and play around with it uh, right away. Um, and it's, it takes just seconds to get set up with. Uh, so as far as Couchbase Lite goes, Couchbase Lite is a uh, embeddable NoSQL database uh, for mobile applications. Uh, it's for iOS, it's for Android, it's for Xamarin, it's for uh, all over the grid. Um, and this is a replacement to SQLite, so you don't have to use uh, SQLite as your relational data store uh, on mobile. You can now have access to a uh, NoSQL data store. When it comes to Sync Gateway, Sync Gateway handles all of the synchronization between mobile and Couchbase server. It handles all of the authentication and authorization. Uh, so read-write rules, uh, all of that good stuff uh, to get syncing between uh, light and server. So Sync Gateway is actually its own uh, web service. So you actually install it on a server. It's a middleman uh, web service. And then, of course, Couchbase server, which we've already uh, discussed. So I'll skip past this slide. A little more on Couchbase Lite. Uh, so it actually runs in process. So uh, when you embed it in your application, you start your application, it's going to start its own little web service. Uh, so it'll expose, if you want it to expose, uh, a URL, a username and password. And this is particularly convenient uh, for one, if you want to do REST requests against it instead of using the SDK, uh, or two, if you want to do peer to peer. So you can actually use another device, uh, capture that URL, maybe through a QR code, maybe through Bluetooth, and do peer to peer between two devices and, and cut Sync Gateway out completely. It's up to you. Uh, it also has a small footprint, so it's about 400 kilobytes in size. Uh, which is rather small, so that way um, not going to eat through your data usage. It's not going to be excessively large, which is very nice. So how do you use Couchbase Lite in a mobile application? Uh, to stay on the topic of JavaScript, because this is Node.js, I've decided uh, I'm going to show you some code around native script, which uses JavaScript as well for developing mobile applications. Uh, so in this case, uh, what we would do is, assuming that we've already downloaded the plugin, uh, we would create a new Couchbase um, object here. We would define the, da the database that we want to open. Uh, in this case, Enroboy database. If it doesn't exist, it'll create it. Uh, once we have this database, uh, we can then call create document and pass it a JavaScript object. Uh, and that will save it. So you can see that my, my object here, a little complex, it has some nested objects in it. Uh, and uh, it's not just a flat piece of data. In terms of querying this data, you are going to be using MapReduce uh, indexes to query this data. So you would build these indexes in your native language. Uh, so if I'm using native script, it would be JavaScript. If I'm using Android, it would be Java or Objective-C for iOS. The results are persisted for very fast querying. And because these MapReduce views are, are functions, you can actually add uh, breakpoint logic and other uh, troubleshooting code uh, into these functions. So for example, to create a view. Uh, so we call create view. We're creating this view. It's called people. Uh, and what we're saying here is uh, if the document has a property called Twitter, it's going to emit a key value pair. Uh, this key is going to be uh, the document ID, and the value is going to be the document itself. Uh, so when we uh, try to execute this query, it's going to return us all documents that have a Twitter handle. Uh, you could add way more complex logic than I did inside of these views. It's completely up to you. Uh, when it comes to uh, querying your data, you, you probably don't want to query your data at every given time. You probably don't want to set timers and do all of that stuff because it's, it's kind of a waste. So what you can do actually instead is you can uh, create changed listeners. You can listen for notifications that something has changed. Um, of course, it cuts down a lot of cruft code. You're not throwing queries everywhere. 
And you can actually set these listeners on uh, different things. So you can set listeners on the entire database. So anything has changed in the database. So you can set listeners on particular queries. Uh, even you can set a listener on it if something has changed in a particular document. So here's what a listener would look like. This listener is for if anything has changed in your database. It, this is local. This is not anything remote, nothing Couchbase server or anything like that. Uh, so in this case, uh, we're listening for changes. And for however many changes come through, because you could have a very large application where 10 changes come in, uh, for however many come through, we're going to check to see if there was a conflict. Uh, because maybe you're working with uh, a lot of different devices, and maybe you have 10 devices that try to change the same piece of data. Uh, you want to know that there was a conflict. Um, and then you could run your own business logic to define, well, which one wins in this scenario of the conflict. You could also check other information, like was this document deleted or what, what's changed? Uh, more in terms of syncing, uh, so we have full multi-master replication with Sync Gateway. Uh, you have the ability to minimize battery drain on your own through the code, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. And then, of course, you can add change notifications based on what happens remotely. Uh, so if, up till now, we only did local. Now let's say we want to add uh, uh, syncing support into our application. At the most basic level, uh, we would add these uh, six lines here. So we would create uh, two pull uh, replication, or we would create a pull replication and a push replication. Uh, we'd pass it in the sync gateway URL. We don't have to do push and pull. We could maybe only do pull, maybe only do push. It's completely up to you. Uh, you this is where the battery drain comes in. You can set it to be continuous replicating or not. So if it's continuously replicating, your battery is draining. Uh, so, and that's fine for some scenarios, but maybe you want to uh, be more, have more definition on that. Maybe you only want it to replicate when you do a pull, pull the refresh, or maybe when you open up your application. Uh, you define that. Once you call start, it's now uh, replicating between uh, device and server. So how do you get Couchbase light? Uh, so there's, there's many different ways to get it. Uh, you can get it through JCentral if you're on Android. Same for Maven Central. Maybe you want to do the JavaScript stuff. You could use NPM. Uh, you can use uh, Git, GitHub. Uh, if you're using iOS, it could be uh, CocoaPods. I do have a demo for mobile uh, to show you how cool this is. And this will, I will be wrapping it up. I think that there's somebody coming in shortly. So I do have two simulators open. Uh, all right, they are visible. I also have Couchbase Sync Gateway running, so it does have its own administrative dashboard. And I'll be clear, I, I don't have this connected to Couchbase server right now. I don't have to. I, for prototyping, I'm using the in-memory storage for it, so when I shut it down, all my data will be lost, and that's fine. Uh, and it is empty right now. So what I'll do is I will create a new, uh, a new record here and hit Save. And you can see that it already synchronized from Android to iOS. So if I go to Sync Gateway here, refresh it, uh, my document does exist there. I've, I've saved the first name and last name. Uh, and then it also has information about the revision uh, and the particular document ID. So let me add one more, and we'll show something cool here. And I realize that his name was autocorrected. That's fine. It did synchronize, and this, I don't have a, a, a way to change documents in this particular app, so I'm going to change it through the sync gateway. I'm going to correct his name here, and I'm going to hit save. It increased the revision. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you can see the highlight, but it increased the revision after I saved it. Uh, it also corrected it uh, in both of the simulators, so it, it synchronized that data down immediately. Uh, so. Uh, the code that powers this application is, is essentially what you saw in my slides. So there wasn't much to power these two applications for Android and iOS. Uh, so you want to wrap it up? Yeah. Yeah, so I think this is sort of a quick summary of what is really Couchbase. You know, you learn about, uh, it's, for, first of all, it's fully open source. So you can go to um, couchbase.com, download. There's a community version that you can download, play with it, dev, test, all of that. If you want to go production, this is a com commercial company that is using open source as a business model. So we definitely provide commercial support on it. So you can do that. Um, 
we learned about Nickel, which is the SQL-like query language that you can use for documenting your JSON documents. You know, if you are no SQL document database does not support a simpler query language, follow the route of Britain. Exit the database. <laughs> um, uh, it's of course JSON documents are stored natively in the database. Uh, we have support for mobile and providing full sync capabilities. Um, developer commit. This is the database has been there for about five plus years now. Um, a lot of people love it and use it. We talk a little bit about multi-dimensional scaling. You know how we have indexed data and query could be set up on separate nodes and let them scale independently. Um, something that developers also like is support for GeoJSON, where you can actually start uh, querying your um, geographical coordinates as well. So this is the final slide, pretty much. Um, Developer.couchbase.com is our developer portal. Uh, Blog.couchbase.com, you know, we check out a lot of blogs over there. We would always love to hear your suggestions. So reach out to us on at Couchbase Dev or at Couchbase, or ask us questions. And tonight there is a party. You know, stop by the Red Hat booths and pick up your gift cards from there. That I is think, all that we have. I think we are out of time too. Uh, we're going to get kicked out soon. Uh, yes. Fantastic. It's a constant evolution, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, thank you guys. Yes, thank you everyone.